This past Monday, I did what a friend of mine does every year to remember the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, I I didn't read or watch his famous I Have a Dream speech. Instead, I read the letter that he wrote from the Birmingham jail. A letter that he wrote to Christians, to, to white Christians who were taking offense at his actions. Dr. King and others, you may recall, were engaged in nonviolent protests as a means to force an honest discussion about racism and how best to bring about true change. If you've never read the letter, I encourage you to do so. It's easy enough to find online, but be Uh, aware of the fact that if you read it, the Holy Spirit may well chasten you. Uh, And that was certainly my own experience. It's a very long letter, something that Dr. King himself acknowledges at the very end, so I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Um, One little caveat, some of his terminology isn't what we would necessarily call PC by our modern standards, but these are his words. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sidelines and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which makes a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. There was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during that period that the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was the thermostat that that transformed the mores of society. Wherever the early church entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contest. Things are different now. The contemporary church is so often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's often vocal sanction of things as they are. Feel a little chastening of the spirit as we think about the modern church. Lord, have mercy on us all. If you'll bear with me, I want to return to just one section in that where Dr. King assesses the early church. He says, wherever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. As I pondered these words on on Monday morning, 
phrase, actually a sentence came to mind, namely God's resolute word brings about enduring change. God's resolute word brings about enduring change. And that change is not only in the lives of individual believers. We touched upon that last week as we talked about God's resolute nature and about how his changeless nature brings about changes in our wayward nature. No, this enduring change is not only in the lives of individual Christians, but also in the nations and the cities and the communities where they live. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than men. These early Christians, as Dr. King astutely points out, had a keen understanding. They had a deep understanding of their place in the world, that they were in the world, but not of the world. They were a colony of heaven. And as such, they were the aroma of Christ wherever they went. They made the unseen seen. They made the not yet now. They turned the other cheek. They loved their enemies. They prayed for those who persecuted them. They understood their place in the world because they understood the nature of God's word. It far surpasses the word of every man, woman, or child. It far surpasses the word of those in authority, be they governors or presidents or kings, or at that time, even Caesar himself. It was a word worth living by. It was a word worth dying for. Because it was resolute. It was an unchanging truth. Somebody recently brought me a bulletin from a church in the greater Boston area. And if you visit churches and they actually have bulletins like we do, bring them back. I'm always curious what other churches are doing and how they're doing it. And as I was reading through this particular bulletin, they had a section called... Um, what is the section called? I'll get it here in a second. It's called uh, About Us. They had this little caveat about us. And there was something in that that struck me. And these are the words that kind of leapt off the page. It says, We believe that God is speak is still speaking and has something new and essential to say to us as we live in this ever more complex and challenging world. Now that stood out to me for two reasons. One, I think that the people in Peter's day and the Israelites in captivity and in their wilderness wanderings might think that our world isn't nearly as challenging as theirs was. And the second thing and the more important thing that stuck out for me is that phrase that God is still speaking, which I have come to understand is like this little code word. It's, this, it's a shorthand way of saying we don't believe everything that has been written in the past and so we will ignore or alter or add to God's word so that it better fits with our desires and the mores of the day. But God's word is resolute. It's timeless. It's unchanging. Even if the world has become more complex, and it certainly has in terms of technology, God's resolute remains unchanged. Take the Eighth Commandment, for example, so so you'll get there. And depending on what your tradition is, you may not get to the same Eighth Commandment that I'm thinking of. But you get to the Eighth Commandment, it says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So whether it's whispering in someone's ear as it was in days gone by or posting something on Facebook, the command to safeguard the reputations of others still stands. And more importantly, God's resolute word still reveals the human condition and the means of rescue. 
in our text from 1 Peter chapter 1 highlights, addresses both the condition and the means. If you want to get your bulletins out, we can look at them together. First, the condition. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. The painful truth, as he points out, is that by nature we are ignorant. By nature we are blind to the fact that not every desire we have is good and God-pleasing. By nature we are unaware of the dire state of our circumstances. That such things need to be revealed to us and the way in which they are made known to us is through God's resolute word. That the Holy Spirit uses the unchanging word of God to convict us of our sins and to dispel every foolish notion that somehow we can work it out on our own. That despite our intellect and our resources, despite our best efforts, We're eventually brought to our knees, and sometimes literally so. Eventually, we're forced to concede that we cannot rescue ourselves in any way, shape, or form. Only God can, and that then leads us to the means. God's means of rescue is Jesus Christ, verses 18 and 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defects. Even though the significance of Jesus Christ is routinely downplayed, and sadly, even among many who claim to be Christians, God's word is resolute. That all people of every age need what Jesus alone does, what Jesus alone offers. In this term, the testimony of Scripture, God's resolute word is clear. If you haven't already, two verses to commit to memory. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. As part of the Pentecost sermon, Peter says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. And the second verse is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, which it says, There is one God... And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom for all people. The world may be more complex, but the same core issue remains. The world may indeed be more complex, but there is no new way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life by his own confession. He alone is the way to the Father. And we can bristle at that truth. We can dismiss the statement of Jesus, but it does not undermine God's enduring word. And that enduring word, as Dr. King points out, brings about enduring change in and through the lives of God's people. Second part, not nearly as long as the first part. Again, we read, but they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven. Think about that. We are a colony of heaven. Some of you are trying to wrap your mind around what does it mean to be a colony of heaven? Is that everywhere we go, we are to be the aroma of Christ. There is something to be different about us in the way in which we live. And if there isn't, perhaps we don't recognize who we are in Christ. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than men. They were small in number, but big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated. I love his language. To be astronomically intimidated, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests because the early Christians believed 
in the living and enduring word of God, they were not shy about challenging the evils of the day. In both word and deed, they championed the dignity of all people. In word and deed, they championed the sanctity of all life, infants and gladiators alike, people of every age and every stage of development, regardless of their health or their quote, end quote, usefulness. I hate to say it, but Dr. King's assessment of the contemporary church remains rather contemporary. And not just for a certain denomination or for a certain color of churches, but for most churches. That what he wrote now 50 plus years ago still rings true. The contemporary church is often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. Perhaps the contemporary church has a weak and ineffectual voice. Because it seeks to please people rather than obey God. Perhaps the contemporary church has a weak and ineffectual voice because it is more interested in pleasing and living by the principles and opinions of people rather than by God himself. Maybe the contemporary church makes an uncertain sound because it no longer stands on and lives by God's resolute word. St. Peter, puts things in perspective for us. Uh, those of us who would judge the word, the word rather than to allow the word to judge us, he, he provides us with a perspective. We who are seeking to change it to meet our desires rather than to be transformed by it into the image of Jesus. Uh, verse 24 He says, all men, all humans, you and I are part of that. All humans are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. Opinions come and go. People come and go, including you and me. One day we'll be gone, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And so as the people of God, then comes the exhortation. It says that we are to be diligent in how we, we, we make use of the word of God. That we are to be like newborn babies. And some of you, it's not that too far uh, away. When you newborn babies, when they are hungry, they want it and they want it now. It says like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that we might grow up in our salvation. that we might more fully experience the goodness of God and that we might more fully bring about enduring change in our communities, in our nation, and in our world. There is no shortage of modern day evils. And it's very easy for us to just stand on the sidelines and allow all those things to happen. To think in terms of the body and the soul and the sacred and the secular as, to, as, as opposed to acknowledge that Jesus came to address both the body and the soul, the sacred and the secular. And as those who bear his name and those who stand upon his resolute wor- word, we have both the, the privilege and the obligation to do so in our own day. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, it never feels good to be chastened. And yet we are grateful that you would convict us if in fact you have. As individual believers and as a community of faith gathered in this place, 
We pray that you would grant us, as the psalmist did, a tremendous love for your word. Recognizing its power and its beauty, its guidance and its way to transform one's life. We pray that more and more that you would bring about an enduring change in us so that we might be made more ready to be this colony of heaven in the places that you have put us. Help us to be that aroma of Christ in all of our spheres of influence. To be empowered by your spirit to live in a way by which others are challenged and yet others are comforted. We do it not for self-congratulation, but we do it for the good of others and for your glory. And so enable us to know that your word is worth living by and in fact it is worth dying for because it is unchanging. It reveals the truth about us and what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. And it also reveals to us your design as to how you will use us in this world until that day when Christ comes again in glory. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, for your church and all of its places under the heavens that it, that we might be, the people you have made us to be, and the people that you have called us and are making us to be. We bless you and praise you, for you are the one who is worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Amen.